All right. So I don't want to talk about the recession more, but everyone is talking about the recession. And it, even my team members are like, can we talk about the recession more so we can get some more pop on YouTube? And so that's no, that's not why I'm doing this. But the recession that we are either technically in in America or that is coming is the thing everyone is freaking out about. And if you're a business owner, it's freaking you out even more. I hear all the whispers, all the doubts, all the fears. And so what I thought would be super fun because I've been talking about this with my wife, Shay, is to bring her on the podcast to talk to her in front of you about our recession plan. Shay is a multi six figure business owner in her own right. We have these conversations around the dinner table. So what we wanted to do was bring you basically into our dinner time conversation as we break down what we're doing in light of the coming economic turmoil, the storm clouds are, are approaching that we think is completely opposite what everyone else is doing, why we're doing it and why we think it can help set you free. We're going to break down details, specific details of what we're doing with our finances. And this will be more fun because it's not just me. I'm bringing on my bride. So I think you'll enjoy this conversation with my wife, Shay. Let's discuss. All right, babe, you're here. You are here on the show. Everyone, this is Shay Cochran. She is my better half. I haven't had her on the podcast yet, which is a shame. But Shay, can you just, for those of us who don't know you, I know a lot of your people have jumped over here and we have some commingling and it's cool. But for my fans that don't know who you are and what you do, break down sort of your business and uh, what you're up to these days. Yeah, it would have been a better intro if you said you had recession expert Shay Cochran joining you today. But alas, it is just me. Why aren't you an expert in recessions? Why that would be a very not? valuable skill I mean, to have this right now. Will have been the second one that we've gone through, so that's, that's got to count for something as business owners. Um, okay, to your question. Thanks for that sweet intro, babe. Yeah, I am. I've been a photographer for a long time, but what I currently do is I run a stock photo agency that exists to support female entrepreneurs, to make sure that their ideas and businesses are seen and heard, that they can show up consistently. And I do that primarily through providing them the images, stock images, and soon to be stock video that just helps them show up online in a polished, consistent, professional, but non-overwhelming way. You know, there's so many different social media platforms. We're not here to talk about that, but it can be very overwhelming for the average small business owner to keep showing up. So we just help them do that. So my background is in photography, and now I do that through photographing inanimate objects and being a CEO of a, of a really awesome stock photo agency called Social Squares. Check it out at socialsquares.com. I will say the images are geared towards female business owners, but hey. It is for the ladies. doesn't mean you can't use them. <laughs> They're really, really, really good images, and it's a phenomenal product. Um, and really what Shay's business does is help other businesses thrive, yeah. which is really, really cool. So I think we both have that same heart for business owners, which is why we wanted to get this conversation going together. It's not just my opinion. Shay knows just as much about this. She has a team of people and then they depend on her business. And so there's, there's some weight there. Um, so first of all, thanks for coming on the show. Babe. This is awesome. Thanks for letting me blow often. up your, uh, your podcast. Yeah, you're welcome. And if everyone listening <laughs> in or watching, if you like this episode, tell us, we'll do more together. If you don't, don't tell us, we're still going to do more together because it's just fun. <laughs> So let's talk about the recession. Let's just talk about the reality because you brought up a good point before we hit record that the moment there was whispers of recession. So if you're in the US, really, if you dork out over this stuff, January of 2022 is when things started to fall apart visibly because all of last year was a phenomenal year economically, really, really good. All time high on the stock market, all time high in the real estate market. Um, you know, unemployment was super, super low. So last year was phenomenal. And then it's like after the new year, all of a sudden the, the stock market in particular took a nosedive. The real estate's still been going up. Now it's starting to dip in some places, but the beginning of the year, the first clear cloud was the stock market like dropping a solid 20, 25% cryptocurrency. Maybe that might have dropped sooner, but yeah. you know, Bitcoin dropped. So those markets started to drop. That got people spooked because they weren't sure why. And then you started to see very, if you dork out over this stuff, right? You started to see the Fed increase the, the interest rates, the rates that they charge to banks, those went up. So then banks have to charge more to us. So that's why mortgage rates went up. And they were doing this because we're starting to see inflation go up. Mm 
and we're seeing inflation go up and because the government printed bajillions of dollars, they just gave everyone checks. What do you think is going to happen? This has always happened. That's his math. When you put too much money in the system, things go up, and but no one wants to talk about that. So anyway. Careful, careful babe. Careful. <laughs> hey, I'm not political. These are just, these are just facts. So <laughs> it all started to fall apart. And then technically a recession is when you've had the GDP, which is basically if you look at the government or the country as like a business, if, if it's profitable, it's a, it's a positive GDP. If it's not profitable, AKA it spent more money than it took in as a country, it's you know the negative. That's a negative GDP. If you have that for two quarters in a row as a nation, you're in a recession. So technically July 1, we found out that we were technically, I think, in a recession. None of that really matters because what matters is what Shay, you were saying is the hysteria of <laughs> YouTubers and content creators trying to be the first to talk about the recession. So tell me like what's yeah. been your experience seeing that content, people freaking out all over or trying to stop us from freaking out by being the first to talk about it, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm not on a lot of the social channels, right? So I'm not I'm not ingesting a lot of YouTube content and and in, even Instagram or TikTok content or anything like that. So I don't know what's happening there. Where I noticed it was in my inbox. You know, a few months ago, it started where all of a sudden these talking heads in the online business space seemingly are trying to be the first to land an email in your inbox saying oh, the recession is coming. What are you What are you going to do about it? Here's my you know ten steps to refresh, recession proof your business and. I just thought that was interesting. I've seen that die, die down a bit now. I, and I'm not seeing the same thing currently, but it was there was a, a period of time where I think I got like three emails within a two week span of people trying to like be the first to warn me of the pending recession and offer their solutions right out of the gate. So I, as a small business owner, I think that probably helped with the spread of the widespread panic, not that it wasn't already on our radar, but all of a sudden when we hear people that we respect talking about it and uh, you know, it's just stirring the pot a little bit and offering their own solutions, yeah, taking a moment to maybe capitalize a little bit on the on the opportunity. I think that that didn't help with what we're currently feeling, which is like bracing for impact as small business owners. Yeah, I think it's the, the reality of, of economic storm clouds appearing and then people talking about it and then the news cycle and then it just it it escalates mm -hmm. to your point. I, I saw people doing, you know, challenges and, and workshops and live trainings with language, which I thought was brilliant, like opt out of the recession. Like you, <laughs> you could choose to not participate in the recession, which I kind of love. Opting in, by opting in to their uh, list. <laughs> opt into my funnel so you can opt out of the. It's smart. Yeah. It's smart, man. Um, smart. So here's the reality though, like um, fear is kind of the problem, right? So people are afraid um, because we, we, we don't do well with uncertainty. So we don't know what's going to happen. We can guess. And some people have a more positive view. Like, I think it'll be fine. And some people have a really, you know, a prepper view, like you need to prep your food, you know? And, and I think the reality is somewhere in between, um, cause this is not that big of a deal. It's, it's just the, the latest iteration of what the world sure. has been going through this. We've gone through world war two, where like the whole world was collapsing. We've gone through nine 11 where people are flying planes into our buildings and like horrific stuff that we thought we would never come back from. Uh, and, and we, we've come back. So, but the reality is, is that we're scared because we don't know what's going to happen in the short term, even whether that's yeah. 12 months or 24 months. And how's that going to affect me? Yeah. Um, what, what I was feeling it, when we talk about the recession and what Shay and I want to get into is the fear and what that does, just like your whole psyche, right? Because if you're fearful, what I'm seeing and what I tend to, this, this would be honest, what I see in myself, since I default to be, I have a high value on security. So I default to being a saver. And so my grip gets really tight on like, <laughs> okay, hold on to my money. Hold on, like, don't make any risky moves or investments. Yeah. And I just, I'm really tense. I'm like, it's gonna be fine gonna be fine but then i'm like why am, why do my muscles hurt so much because i'm so tense i'm exhausted i'm exhausted for doing nothing i feel and i don't know from your perspective i feel like that's what a lot of people are doing right now is they're just hunkering down and they're just not sure what to do next and they're so afraid of being wiped out financially mm -hmm. of Lose, if they're a business owner, losing customers. I've yeah. had a lot of talk in my membership right now. Like I just did a launch and it didn't do as well. Do you think yeah, it's the timing yeah. of th these types of fears? Can you, can well, you speak to what do you feel about what we're recovering it? from too? Like you also have to attach that to what we've just gone through as business owners over the last two years. Yeah. So we're a little gun shy, right? The um, pandemic had a different effect on everyone's business, some for the better, but a lot 
presented a lot of challenges. So we're kind of already, we're still a little tense. And now we've got this new information, new challenge, new fears, new obstacles. And it's making us very, uh, it's just compounding, I think, how it feels for the average small business owner in the current moment to proceed forward as a business owner with joy, curiosity, possibility. Um, I think that that kind of life is being sucked out of the entrepreneurial space by what we've gone through and now, you know, what feels very pending. Yeah, that's a good point. Do you, how do I want to put this? Do you think that there's any warrant, anything like any merit to, to being fearful in your business? Like, have you personally found success in decision-making as a fearful business owner? So I'm not going to answer that question the way you probably think I'm going to, because the automatic response would be like, no, you know, we shouldn't make decisions based on fear. But we know that fear serves, can serve us, right? It can either serve us to make changes or it can paralyze us and keep us from moving forward or cause us to retract. And that's what we don't want. But fear is a wonderful signal that there's something that we should pay attention to. So fear absolutely is an opportunity to assess things. Maybe you've been a little loose-handed in your business spending. Maybe you, you know, have created something that isn't very sustainable when the economic situation changes. I mean, fear is a wonderful, uh, can be a wonderful, present a wonderful opportunity to say, okay, is this as scalable as I want it? Is this, is the product offering still as relevant as it was initially? Is this going to continue to be relevant when people are a little bit tighter with their spending? Um, so I think fear can be wonderful. And I can see looking back, even the season I'm in now with my own fears and insecurities, it can be a very good catalyst if I look at it with openness and possibility and say, okay, what opportunities are, are being afforded to me right now? Then, then I can harness fear to kind of lead me down a really great path of new possibilities, or I can exactly do exactly what you described, get really heavy handed, get really close fisted, um, want to shrink back, want to retract, want to dial in, be cautious, be careful in a way that really closes down opportunities and keeps me from being curious about what the possibilities might be. So I think fear is, is neutral, right? Fear isn't necessarily good or bad. It's what you do with it that will impact how you proceed forward and what opens up for you. So I think the fear that we're talking about trying to avoid is that like doomsday, you know, holding on to things very tightly, being closed minded in in how we're approaching the next few years, hunkering down, you know, panicking. And, And some of the practical application of that is like panic offers, panic flash sales, panic, you know, pivots in our business that aren't made out of excitement or energy or curiosity, but they're made out of like, out of fear in the worst sense of the word. No, that's a great point. And they're not even made out of data or research right, or f- wise thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always felt like I want to set myself up as much as possible to not be put in a situation where I'm desperate because mm-hmm. when I'm desperate, I will do dumb things. I have never made a good decision <laughs> in desperation. So yeah. Some, some of those things you can control, right? Like practically speaking, if you have savings in the bank that helps you have a little bit of a mental cushion right. of like, okay, I'm not as desperate. I'm at least a couple months between me and yeah. desperate, you know, um, <laughs> that, that's better than nothing. That helps you have yeah. a little bit of wisdom. Um, and we've uh, seen that. I mean, that emergency yeah. fund has helped us weather more than one storm. <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, um, I want to get into what our plan is, but just, just by way of segue, I mean, Shay alluded to it. Um, Shay and I walked through this in 09. Okay. So we walked through the great recession. Some of you are too young to know what that felt like, which is crazy to me. That's, that makes me <laughs> feel old. That old. I know, but the, you look at the numbers, some of these people were kids, um, and they're crushing it right now, but you know, their parents walked through it. Um, yeah. for us, we didn't have a lot of it at stake in terms of like, we lost a lot of wealth or, or lost a house. We were broke as a joke. <laughs> we were just broke. Yeah. We didn't lose millions of dollars. We had just had nothing. We just lost a couple jobs. Um, so I'm not trying to minimize it, but it was a painful time even for us. I mean, you know, my story a bit, if I've shared it here that, 
in 2009 is when we moved to Florida and I lost two jobs and Shay and I had our first child. We bought our first house and then I lost my second job. And we did have an emergency fund. We had $10,000 that we had saved up. Thank you, Dave Ramsey, for that encouragement. And yeah. But we blew through that. That was about three months of expenses. And then maybe we milked it to four months if we tightened up a little bit more. But living off of 2500 to 3000 a month, I mean, that was about it. Yeah. And then the money was out. And so that we were on food stamps for 18 months and you've heard the story. The point is, is we've walked through this before in 2009, 2010, when the whole world was saying this, it's over. Like I remember being freaked out even in 2008, when it was starting to happen, the, the, the emails I was seeing, the blog posts I was seeing, and people were like the system that we are part of this, we know it will never again be the same. Like banks won't exist. There won't be any mon- monetary system. Like it's going to be chaos in the streets. I was like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? It was way overblown for one. But Sounds being, a little bit like what we're hearing now. Ironically. This is absolutely. If you want a fun <laughs> exercise, just go look up the New York Times or Wall Street Journal headlines during the last major recession. So 2000, mm. 2009, 2000 and 2001, we had the dot com bubble, uh, you know, the late 80s. The late, so go back and find the headlines. They all are the same. They grab all your like, wife, grab your kids. Yeah, grab exactly. Your gun. <laughs> and you would think this is a 2022 article. No, this was 1987, you know, like Black <laughs> Friday or whenever that was and the stock market dropped 30%. Like, Anyway, nothing is new, right? Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun. But my point was, is it was in that season of freak out that we started this business. And mm-hmm. Shay was pivoting from regular photography eventually into product photography for brands. And, and then I was starting a content business. I didn't realize it. It was in that season that we grew something. And we weren't the only ones. If you think about how many businesses were started during that last recession cycle, like the Airbnbs of the world, like a bajillion massive companies were started that year. Mm-hmm. because to your point, people had to get creative. Yeah. And so they shifted. And this is where I want to segue. They shifted from, oh crap, my business is dying or might die. Cause Hey, your business may not die. It's you probably can actually be fine, but let's yeah. say it could. Yeah. They were like, how else could I add value in the marketplace? How else could I serve? And maybe it means I start another business or maybe it just means I, I change my offers a bit or the positioning mm-hmm. of my offers. It's going to be different for all of us. But money is made in a recession because there's mm-hmm. still need and it, it's just the creative few that last. And so the, here's the punchline is our recession plan in one word would be generosity. Right? Would you agree? We're just going to give it away. <laughs> We're just going to give it away. Yeah. Which, which is ridiculous. But talk, talk us through like where, where this mindset comes from. Why are we landing here? And then like, maybe we can share some examples of how we've been doing that. Not perfectly, but trying to. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll st- I'll start, and you jump in wherever you want. I mean, I think this isn't a new plan, right? This is something that we uh, experimented with, were led into during the first recession, right? It was like, okay, there's not money coming in, but what happens if we continue to give it out? And at the time, it was through tithing to our local church. Um, what happens if instead of like holding on tighter, even though I have no guarantee that it's going to keep coming in, what if we give and continue to give? What's going to happen? What will the effect be? Are we going to run out? Are we going to be on the streets? Or are we going to see something else happening? And and our experience was that the more generous we were then, the more um, we saw it come back in in business success. I'm trying to like find a better way to put that. But that is the reality of what happened. Like we were, we felt like we were called to be generous in that season, even if we didn't know what was coming our way. And so to the extent that we walked that out and did it, uh, we saw business growth and we saw the money returned. Um, So this isn't new, right? This isn't new. We've also tried to build our lives around this over the last few years. So Graham and I have felt from the beginning that we wanted to be givers. We're talking financially, but also as a as a way of running a business. I mean, there's lots of different ways that you can be generous. So we'll talk a little bit more specifically about the money piece. Um, we always wanted to be big givers. And so it started with the 10%. And then over time, every year, we try to push it a little bit, 12%, 13%, 14%, 15%, 15%. pre-tax, post-tax. I mean, the, there was years when it was like a number and we wanted to give away 
$150,000 or and not knowing what was going to come in. And so we would set financial goals. So this whole concept of like generosity as our recession plan isn't necessarily a new one. Now, I think, and we'll get into it like this, we've kind of upped the ante a little bit. Um, but this feels like a specific call on our lives that we have seen. Um, we've, we've just been blessed by, right? We've been, not, I don't mean that like we're giving to get, but I mean, and you've talked about this probably before, um, there's something that you gain internally by being gener- a generous person. Uh, it opens up an experience with life that is different than someone who holds tightly onto everything. So we get to experience the gift and the joy of, of giving. And that has been a sweet place that the more we experience, the more we want to continue to live there. So every year we've kind of kind of challenged that and what that's looked like has been different. Um, But as we go into the recession, we are simultaneously trying to go into one of the most outrageously generous seasons that we will have ever walked through as a couple. Again, not knowing how it's going to turn out, but feeling like, man, that's the type of person I want to be. And that's the type of joy that I want to feel. And that's the type of open-handed approach to life and loving others that I want to walk in, even if the stakes are high. So that's where we find ourselves now is like, okay, yeah, maybe a recession, but also we're, we're trying to up the ante on what we're doing. So that I'll tease it with that. And then you can kind of take it in whatever direction you want to go in. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. So for us, it, you're, I love that. It's not new, but but like we sense, okay, we have a choice and this is where I want you to land in this episode. I want you to lean into this is okay. It might be, it might be a crap show next year financially <laughs> in the, it might be, I don't know, it might be fine, but let's say it's a crap show. You have a choice. Either you freak out and hold on tighter to what you have, mm-hmm. which is, you can't argue with this. It's inward self-focused, mm-hmm. which is just a fact. But how does that make you feel when you're bent in on yourself and you're holding on tight? That's your one option. Or the other option is to, loosen the grip, open up your hands and give more away, which is the opposite of what you naturally want to do. It's the opposite of what I naturally want to do because I told you earlier, I have a high value of security and safety and I'm a saver when it comes to like a money profile. Some are spenders, some are saver. I'm a saver. Um, I don't need to buy things. I just like having lots of money in the bank or it makes me feel good. So it's the opposite of what I want naturally, but I get a benefit. So I'm not doing this just because I'm a good person. I get a benefit. When I open my hands and give, a lot of benefits happen. One that's interesting is there's, and I love this, at the University of Notre Dame, there's an entire research lab. It's called the Science of Generosity Initiative. There's an entire, this is funded, and all they do is study the science of generous people and what that looks like. And so they've done these studies, and they have found that there's a measurable, people who give, one of the the stats is people who give 10% of their income away or more uh, to charity are 35% happier than people who give less than 10% or nothing at all. So there's, they can measure it. I don't know how they're measuring it, but the point is this is just science that when you give, you are actually happier, which is cool because that's what something that Jesus said 2000 years ago, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And the Greek word for blessed means happy making. He literally said it's happier for you when you give than you receive. Imagine how much joy you get when you receive a gift you get more joy when you give a gift and you know that when you've gotten someone an amazing present for Christmas or their birthday, you like, you can't wait for them to open it. And that experience, like that's more satisfying than even getting the gift you've always wanted. And so Jesus is playing on that. This, this science initiative, you know, the initiative of science of generosity is playing off of that. Like there's something that goes on, whether it's endorphins that are released or whatever, chemically, we're just figuring out this was just a scientific principle. You are going to be happier if you give to I, I think it's a shifting of a, of a posture, which is the more you look at the news, the more you look inward. This happened during COVID and, and no condemnation if you were really fearful in COVID or if you lost somebody in COVID, but you know what it's like when the news cycle was just doom, doom, doom. The more you watch it, the more you just turn in on yourself, the less you watch it, you're like, oh, I think everything's actually fine. Mm-hmm. And th- nothing has changed out in the world. So what's changed is just like the self-focus and self-protection is exhausting. Like self-protection is exhausting, right? And what's so interesting about that is that why do we do that? We Why do we bend towards control? Like, okay, the situation is scary. I'm going to circle the wagons. I'm going to hold on tighter. I'm going to, you know, and that's what we're aiming for in that situation is control. Because we think that a feeling of being in control is going to bring in peace, right? That's what we ultimately want. We want peace and happiness and we want to be able to relax and we want to be okay. But 
ironically, it does the opposite of that. The more we control, the less peace we feel, the more manic we feel, the more angsty we feel. So we're trying to get to peace through control. And what you and I have learned over the last 13 years is that that's <laughs> we're not going to land at peace when we're trying to control. We actually land at peace when we loosen up control and when we start to give and when we start to open ourselves up to need the needs of others <laughs> and the impact that we can continue to have in the world, even if it means that we're going to have to give up a little bit. So it's just interesting to me that like what we're aiming for is peace, but we think control mm. and holding on tightly is going to get us there. And the reality is it, it takes us in the opposite direction. Oh, I love that you brought that up. And there's so many things that you can't control. And so I think there's an illusion of control because then here's the question that I, I ask myself, because I'm a saver. Okay, Graham, how much is enough? How much money can you save up now to feel safe for the next unforeseeable time frame that we might be in the economy, bad economy or, or how can I set up my business enough so that I can be sure without a shadow of a doubt that it won't fail? Like there's a, I'm drawing an arbitrary line like, and coming up with a number that makes me feel good, but that's still arbitrary. What if that's not enough? So that you never know if you're really fully safe from economic collapse. And so to me, that's an exhausting, unending, unwinnable game. Yeah. So why not play a different game? So what we're trying to do is, is go the opposite direction and realize, you know what? Um, we are always been, we've always been generous um, since we were broke. And I'm glad you brought that up because I, I, I talk about generosity a lot and I get pushed back sometimes. Like, yeah, easy for you to say, Sure, you yeah. make a lot of money. I'm like, no, nah, you yeah. don't know my story, bro. You yeah. don't know my story. If you're not a giver when you're broke, you're never going to be a giver. There was a point in time where, uh, correct me if I'm remembering, misremembering this, but we only had a guaranteed $500 a month in income and we were giving away $500 a month. We'd committed to giving away $500 a month. Right. Cause I was getting a $500 <laughs> a month. Fun math. <laughs> yeah. The math doesn't make sense. We were, I was getting a $500 a month stipend from our church cause I was a volunteer worship uh -huh. leader and my pastor felt bad for me when we lost my job. So he's like, can we give Graham something? So they give me 500 bucks. That was the only check Guaranteed we would get. Yeah. Everything else was like, I was starting a business that didn't make yeah. money. Shay was like, I'll try to take weddings. So there was no guarantee, but we felt God say, I want you to give $500 a month. Um, <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's what I make. You know, <laughs> that would be all of it. <laughs> That'd be a hundred percent. Um, and so guys point yeah. being like, yeah. yeah, we know what it feels like yeah. to try to step into a life that's marked by generosity when you don't have very much to give. And that's why this conversation isn't just about money. There's mm -hmm. a lot, there's a, or there are a lot of different ways you can show up as a generous giving person, but yes. you know, we're talking about the, the finances right now. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll share, here's what we're doing. And then I want to walk through some things for you to think about that you can do um, to be, to make this your recession plan, or at least part of your recession plan. So practically speaking, this, one of my goals, one of my dreams for, I don't know how many years, babe, I don't know if you remember when I started talking about this, but was to give away 50% of our income. Mm -hmm. To me, like that was like, that would be incredible. Like if, if everything that came in half went out and we, and then we kept half and you got to pay taxes and all that kind of fun stuff. But 50% was just a number that got stuck in my head. Yeah. Um, I love the story of Zacchaeus in the Bible. Um, he, you know, he's, he's a tax collector. And the back in those days, they were, they were basically thieves. They just, they took more money and they just got rich off of, of, of the, the, they were the, the people that we basically demonize today as all business owners are like stealing. And well, there were not, but tax collectors back then were, and he has this in, interaction with Jesus and completely his heart's changed. We don't know what happened at dinner. All we know is what he says after dinner, which is like, Hey, I'm going to pay back everyone that I've stole four times what I've stolen from them. And then I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor moving forward. And for whatever reason, that story resonated with me of like, wow, like if that guy can give half away, like with his heart changed, like I want to give half away. And so I was like, one day we'll get there. We've been candidly up to this summer, we've been giving about 30% away of all of our profit mm -hmm. that comes in. And this summer we were in Puerto Rico and uh, we had some crazy stuff happen. We don't have time to get into right now, but we felt it very clear. I was like, I feel like I would like to get to 50%, but this feels like the worst time to do it. And I thought I was going to slowly, <laughs> slow, uh, maybe by age 50, you know, like yeah. I had this idea, like one, I know one, one buddy that gives 50, um, 50. He, I mean, it sounds great. <laughs> 50, 50. Yeah. One guy knows gives a percentage. He gives his age is what he, so if you're 39, you're giving 39%. If you're 40, Ooh, I was like, oh sure. I'll, I'll get up there. What happens when he makes it to 80? Oh man. I don't know. I hope you die. I guess you're out of money. 
But, but, but all of a sudden we just felt like, no, go now. Why, why wait? Yeah. What if you just gave more now? People, and here's the thing, people are going to need it. And that's the other thing I felt is like, if the recession's coming, people are going to need help. If we all shrink into ourselves when the recession hits, think about all those who don't have the superpower you and I have, which is to create wealth as a business owner. The, the, the real hurt is going to happen in the third world. It's going to happen even in our country with just yeah. when nobody cares about the homeless, nobody cares about uh, orphans, nobody cares about uh, you know the foster system. Nobody ca- like We're all going to shrink into ourselves. And I'm not making any judgment call, but I was like, oh my gosh, like this is when we need to unlock the resources the most because of the storm clouds coming. So on a practical level, that's been the biggest shift is like, okay, 50%. So yeah. like my saving goals went, they plummeted because <laughs> I'm not making any more money right now. Maybe I will, but the giving went way, way up. Yeah. And it's, I'm going to be real with you. Like I, I know in my heart, this is what I want to do. And I can feel really great about it for like three days. And then one day comes, I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, what am I doing? So it's Whose not idea easy. Was this? <laughs> it gets hard. The more money you make, the harder it gets to give. It's easier to give when the dollars are small, harder to give when you see the zeros. You always think it's going to be the opposite. Oh, when I have more than I need, then I'll give. But I promise you, it gets harder to give when you see the numbers. Um, Shay, can you talk about like one specific thing we did with the girls um, to oh, sort yeah. of show them? Because I think this would be a helpful example for people. Yeah. So um, it's really cool. One of the local churches in our neighborhood a month or so ago gave away, decided to give away gas cards to everyone that was at church that morning. That was really cool. Just hundreds and hundreds of gas cards. This was right at like the peak of gas prices. Um, So everyone's kind of struggling to fill the tank. And the church just decided to give away, you know, literally, I think thousands actually of gift cards, of literal gift cards to whoever was there that Sunday morning. And that got us thinking, man, we have the resources to do this. And specifically, we set aside some money in our budget that we uh, allocate as undesignated giving. So Graham said we've so far been operating out of 30% um, giving, and that gets split into a few different places. But one category that I love the most is like undesignated giving, meaning there's going to be a certain percentage uh, that we just set aside And it's not going to go to any particular place until we hear of a need that is really meaningful to us. So that has looked like giving to help friends adopt children or buy someone a Christmas tree that couldn't afford a Christmas tree at Christmas. Or, you know, it just kind of is a little pocket of funds and we keep our ears open for the need. And then when the need arises, we give in whatever way that we can give. So that's just very fun. That could also mean treating people to dinner. That could also mean buying someone, you know, a meal. There's a lot of different things you could do with it, but that's fun to me that we set aside that little undesignated giving. So we've had a decent amount building up over time. And so we decided to get the girls involved in going out, kind of using the example that that church had set out and buying Publix gift cards, so local grocery store and gas cards. And we got about 20 of each and had the girls write a little note and tie a little ribbon. And then we drove through the neighborhood and asked the girls to like, just kind of prayerfully decide where to give these. So we just literally got all of us got in the car with all these little gift cards, the little note, anonymous note um, in our neighborhood, because we really want to make an impact where we are. And we just drove through the neighborhood and the girls would like pick a house and someone would run up and put it in the mailbox and, you know, walk away and we'll never get to see (laughs) what their reaction was, you know, who, who got it? What did they do with it? How did they feel? We'll never know the answers to those questions, but we know that we were able to make a small difference in the lives of, you know, 20 different families in our neighborhood. And it felt so good and was so fun. And it was so great to get the kids in on that. And it, it doesn't have to be that big. Um, I did a similar thing with my team. So this is even before Puerto Rico, before we decided that we were going to give 50%. Um, me and my team have been talking about like, what is it going to look like? Who's going to succeed in the recession? Okay. What small businesses are going to succeed in the, in the recession? And one of the conversations that we had was it's going to be the, the businesses that 
are the most generous, that show up the most for people, that provide the most customer service, that provide the most value. That pro- and, you know, all the small businesses that are just kind of siphoning dollars out of people or, you know, kind of clickbaity businesses that aren't delivering on a lot of value, they're not going to survive the recession. That's what's great about a recession is that it's really going to kind of filter out the businesses that are not pro- providing a legitimate amount of value. So, that's what you have in your favor if you're going to be one of the businesses that decides to show up in a even bigger way and in a genuine, authentic, generous way with the information that you're sharing, with the free information that you're giving away, with the way that you're engaging with clients and customers. I personally think those are going to be the businesses that succeed. So the conversations we were having uh, were around that concept. Like, how can we be even more generous in the way we do customer service? How can we be more generous with our members? Because I run a membership site. What else could we give them? Um, how else can we show up in a generous way, not just financially? So we were kind of already having those ideas, but I wanted to kind of up the ante with them and give them a taste of the joy that we're talking about that comes from giving, like the happy making that comes from the chance to give and let, and not everybody feels like they can give in a big way. So, you know, not everybody has gotten the chance or maybe they're just afraid to. So not everyone has gotten, has stepped into that and felt that kind of, um, benefit in giving. So I wanted to give everybody on my team the chance to experience that without it being painful for them. So I gave everybody on the team $500 right before we went to Puerto Rico and said, I want you to, you know, do whatever you want with this money that is giving it to others. So that is an act of generosity. I want you to give it entirely away. Um, but involve your family, involve your spouse, get creative. All I ask is that come back and like share the story. When I get back from Puerto Rico, come back and and at our next team meeting, I want to hear all these stories of generosity. And it was awesome. I mean, some people gave, uh, one of the girls gave it to a local struggling um, arts theater that she really believes in and wants to support and is kind of like a, a central part of her local community. Another person gave it to a neighbor who I want to say maybe it was like a single mom. Another person gave it to, there was a connection with Ukraine. They gave money. um, I don't know if it was like to a specific family or organization, but regardless, you know, we've got all these people, all everyone on my team got to get together and share stories of generosity. And it was enormously rewarding for them and enormously fun. And that was the point, right? Was to give them a taste of what we're talking about. Just like a little taste of how fulfilling and joyful giving can be. So at this point, I've totally lost track of your question, (laughs) but that's kind of, you know, what that has looked like for us specifically, both the 50% and then like thinking about generosity as a business owner, because I don't want you, there are lots of ways to apply what we're talking about. It doesn't mean that you have to give 50% of your money away, but punchline is I think the generous businesses are going to win. Yep. Generosity <laughs> always wins. No, it's so great. And and the reason why and I'm glad you touched on that because I wanted to get there is this, this will be a, a massive cleansing. Yeah. There's gonna be a lot of, mm-hmm. you know, they say even a Turkey can fly in a tornado. There's been a lot of people who've been <laughs> looking great, but it, but when the, sure. when the market settles down, all the businesses that are built on a house of cards will fail. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's going to be a reset for those businesses. But if you are in, if you as a business owner have a heart of generosity and then you display it through, like Shay was saying, the, your customer service, you over delivering, you giving more value than you take in payment, which it should be very basic. Yeah. I think business principles, you're going to stand. And here's why, because on a practical level, generosity is attractive. Right. Mm-hmm. Generosity is magnetic. I always try to think like, you, you know, you listening in and watching this, think of the most generous person that you know in real life. This could be the person that always buys your meal when you go out or the person who anytime you need something, they are, they're always somehow magically available to come over to your house and help you. They're generous with their time. Mm-hmm. Uh, think of that person in your mind. It could be a family member or friend, someone that is like the most generous person you know. And then what are the feelings you have towards that person? Mm-hmm. You're like, man, she is awesome. Or like he, he's all like, I want, I want my kids to be like him or my kids. Like you, you're attracted to that person in a non-sexual way, just in like a, that, that's like a crushing it as a human because Mm -hmm. they're generous. It smells different. It tastes different. And you have an opportunity in your business 
in or out of a recession to be magnetic if you are just generous. And so you get to be creative as a business and then as your personal finances in what generosity looks like in your home and in your business. We're not telling you to, please don't just give 50% away unless you feel very compelled to do that. Um, but the point is, is the generous people prosper and generous businesses prosper. You and- know, a type of generosity that I want to touch on that I love because it's free and you, you model this very well, is generosity verbally. It costs you nothing to encourage other people in your industry. It costs you nothing to be more generous verbally with your team, building them up, calling out their strengths, um, thanking them more profusely. It That costs you nothing to pause a beat at the mailbox when you see your neighbor and say like, hey, your yard's looking really great. Or how's work going? Like, I've been thinking about you. It costs you nothing to give verbally. And so even if you don't feel like you know, I hope everyone knows someone that's really generous with their finances or with their time. But I bet if nothing else, you know someone who's generous verbally, who says, I love you, who says, you look great today, who says, you're doing such a great job with X, Y, Z, who says, you know, you're just so fun to be around. It is it is amazing to me how rigid and uh, selfish we are about verbal generosity. Like we just don't, we're so insecure. We don't like to build other people up and be generous with our words. So I just love that that's like, oh, you probably know someone like that, that as Graham's kind of like walking you through this visualization, that that comes to mind, that you love to be around those people, right? Because they don't, they're not going through life like they have everything to lose, right? They're going through life secure, confident. I can build you up because I feel secure in who I am. I can compliment what you're doing because it doesn't mean, say anything about what I'm doing. I can support you in this shared industry that we work in without it me needing to be fearful that it's going to take away from my clients and my revenue. So um, I just an encouragement, like, man, words are free. Mm-hmm. If you can do nothing else, can you increase your generosity verbally, the way you're showing up in relationships, both professionally and personally. And you're going to see, you're going to see an enormous impact, even if that's the only area that you can be generous in. Oh man, mic drop. I love that. Babe, you're so wise and you're so beautiful. Um, (laughs) I'm trying to practice it right now. Good job. That was good execution. Guys, let me just leave you with this paradox. Um, It's a 3000 year old paradox. And then I want to give you a resource to put in your hand and we'll wrap up. Um, King Solomon, 3,000 years ago, what the his historians say Queen of Sheba, all these people came, like would drive and send their caravans miles and hundreds and thousands of miles to meet this guy because they wanted to see his wisdom. So super wise. He was also really, really, really rich and stuff, but he wrote all these proverbs, these wise sayings. And one of them that just continues to blow my mind and I just stew on it. And it's a paradox is he says in Proverbs 11, 24 and 25, he says, one gives freely yet grows all the richer. Hmm. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. So it's like, wait, what? (laughs) And then he, he gives you one more verse just to like drive the point home. If you refresh others, you yourself will be refreshed. Mm -hmm. And this, my friend is the better way to live your life. You have a choice. Recession's coming or it's here or it's not or it's over and then another one will come. They're cyclical, friend. Every six to seven years, we have a recession. Look it up. But the point is when bad times come and when good times come, givers prosper. If you give freely, the paradox is you will grow all the richer in every sense of the word. When you are verbally generous, people are verbally generous with you. When you give your time, people want to give their time for you. When you give money, somehow you have enough, if not more than enough. But the benefit you get from being a generous person is inside. You are freer. You are holding on less tightly. You actually can breathe because you realize, you know what? I'm going to be fine. And it's not all about me. And there's probably people that are struggling more than I am right now. And there's no obligation. There's no pressure. But I want to just have an open hand in my life and go help people. Mm It's a much sweeter place to be. Let me give you a resource and then we'll wrap this up. Um, 
I have in my course, Automatic Income Academy, I ended the entire course on a module that I was like, this is either going to go great or not go great. <laughs> and I, it's a whole course on how to build a business, right? And I'm not trying to sell it to you. But at the very end, I end the entire course on a module on generosity. And it's called Generosity, the Power Tool for Long-Term Business Growth. And I put this in there because I've taught this to people live and people have been weeping. And it's <laughs> like, and you know, and I don't know, I don't know. I'm like, this is powerful stuff. To me, this is like, what Shay and I have been trying to do, what we've been trying to learn, but I think it sets people free and it gets them thinking about how, man, how could I be more generous in my business? And so what I wanted to do was give you this module for free, whether you have my course or not. So just go That's to grandcochran.com. Right, how generous of me. <laughs> Every week I'm giving these people free stuff. They just gotta get on my email list for it. No, but <laughs> seriously though, I want you to have this. Just go to grandcochran.com slash generosity. Or if you're watching on YouTube, link to it in the description. And it's just the module pulled out. I think it will give you a ton of practical ideas on how to, okay, Graham, how do I apply generosity in my business? Mm -hmm. And Shay touched on some of those things. I love the idea of collaboration. Some of my biggest um, rewards financially have come from being so generous to my competitors and turning them into collaborators, mm -hmm. bringing them right back home. And then we both win. And so there's a lot of ideas in that module. I think it'll get your wheels turning. It's about 20, 25 minutes. And it's free. Just grahamcochran.com slash generosity. Babe, did you have fun? We did have fun. Did you have fun? Yeah. How do you feel sharing the spotlight is the real question. I'll share it with you any day. We'll see. Well, it'll be a competition who has better hair. That's easy. <laughs> How much product did you put in yours? Not as much as mine, probably. Not as much as yours. <laughs> Just si side tangent before we wrap up this episode. I'm getting more and more comments. I'll be doing coaching calls and people are asking uh, legit questions. And now I'm getting more comments on questions like, what hair product are you using? I'm like, <laughs> guys, keep it together. These are men asking me. <laughs> We're here to do business. If so. you become an influencer, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Newsflash, my New Year's resolution I've already started is to <laughs> dump all of this stuff. Forget business coaching. I'm going to just be an influencer for hair care products <laughs> and other man-centric oh, stuff. Man. Guys, thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out with us. We went a little bit long today. If you enjoyed this episode, please let us know. Um, if you're listening, email us in or give us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you're watching on YouTube, just let us know in a comment because then we can actually interact with you. Do we need to bring Shay on the show more? Let me know because she's pretty awesome. But please pick up the generosity piece, grahamcochran.com slash generosity. And most importantly, just go be generous. Let's go head on into this recession just in try a different it. direction. Yeah, if you don't like it, you can always go back to whatever you're doing before. <laughs> we'll see you on another episode. We'll see you.